So good morning, everyone. Um, on a much cooler Thursday morning, it won't be long before I'm doing these virtual crow chats in my woolly hat. So that's something to look forward to or not. So this morning, I am delighted to have with us leading consultancies Atkins and Tanner and Tanzend as they take us into an unknown broad world of the digital space. So are you sitting comfortably? Let us take you on a journey from military service to the digital space. Over to you, Angela. OK, so hello, everyone. My name is Angela Forbes, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you. So thank you for dialing in. So this morning, as Caroline says, we extend a very warm welcome to Atkins and Turner Townsend, to global giants and market leaders in the digital space. So they will guide us through how digitalization has transformed all that we do and the services that they provide, but more importantly, what it looks like in our sector of construction. So our speakers today who are going to translate and educate are Simon Pill from Atkins and Nathan Marsh, Marsh from Turner Townsend. We'll take questions at the end, so feel free to write any comments in the box as we go. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Simon to kick us off. This is uh, just a in a CV reverse chronological order, um, a breakdown of my career from um, when I joined the Royal Air Force as a telecommunications technician way back in 1987, when I was but a lad, um, take me right through to, to where we are now. So currently I am a principal service architect uh, with Atkins, and I'll come on to a little bit of what that, what that means, um, uh, sort of a day in the life of, of, of what I do um, at the moment of, um, I've got there. Um, so, as, as, as stated, as seen there, um, joined, the, um, joined the Air Force as a 16-year-old lad um, uh, uh, to be a telecommunication technician. What I wanted to do growing up, I wanted to fix rate, but when I realised that I was um, too lazy and, and intellectually challenged to be a fighter pilot, um, to, so because I was of the age that Top Gun um, uh, a lot to do with my career choices, um, I wanted to fix radios, and that's what I did. Um, I served for nine years um, in uh, various um, various roles. Predominantly uh, started off in um, satellite ground um, stations down in in Hampshire, um, and spent a couple of um, a very a very enjoyable years in Cyprus, uh, working on HF radios, um, and then. Um, I came back um, to the UK and worked in tactical communications, uh, which meant a lot of travel. The predominant reason that I left the Air Force um, was that uh, I was in a, a squadron of 50, all of the same rank, all technicians, all doing the same job. Um, I wasn't one of the fit ones, I am sort of a bit of a cart horse. Um, the, the, the fat lad at the back, I think, was a, um, I think it's a, actually a, a cycle a brand that do that now uh, that was me never really going to shine and spent um, about 170 days a year away from home um, which wasn't really what I wanted to do um, and uh, we had our first baby so um, the opportunity came um, I think the lads had his CV written um, for him it was way before the internet uh, and uh, we all stole a copy changed the names at the top 10 of us sent the CVs off to an agency uh, and I got a, a an interview and, and successful job offer uh, with um, cable and wireless. Um, he, the the boss there was an ex navy chief, and he selected to surround himself with ex forces, so it was a bit of a halfway house. So I moved from um, telecoms, um, uh, well, telecoms technician, um, into the world of um, actual telecoms, uh, and was shift leader in the global network management centre, uh, which was great. Uh, he told me at the interview I'd last eighteen months. Uh, because it was burnout, um, I lasted lasted 19, uh, and I don't think it was conscious effort to prove him wrong. And from there, I moved out to I was in London, moved out of London um, to work for Capgemini um, as a as a, to run their network and desktop support team from a data center that they had at the time in Bristol. Sorry, not Bristol, Bedford. I live in Bristol now. I was confused myself. Um, uh, and I sort of team leading um, and sort of desktop support. Been on the on the tools there, um, and that I'm great. Um, and then year 2000, dot com boom. Um, I was very proud to be um, sort of uh, been headhunted um, into what was Logica and now called CGI. And then realised that in 2000, um, everybody was uh, was being headhunted. The job market was just absolutely bonk, similar to it is now actually. Um, so I was there, so I moved to um, to to Logica as it was um, because of my knowledge of networking in and out of data centres. Um, I never used that skill, which was great. Um, I, I 
uh, straight into the technical delivery management roles uh, around application support. Um, I'll come on to sort of some of the, the sort of, you know, why I think being X forces means that that's not a challenge, um, and sort of you know the, the 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 skills and the work ethic we have um, being forces X forces um, uh, sets you uh, really uh, in uh, stead for things like that. Um, I was asked to do a piece of business analysis around the resourcing and recruitment um, processes, and as a recommendation from that, I said that we need, you know, we needed a resource and recruitment manager, and I applied for the job um, internal. And uh, I was successful, so I then spent a, a number of years in and around resourcing, uh, recruitment, uh, resource management is very much like internal recruitment. So when we have projects um, that need resources, looking at the pool of people that we have internal, people who are coming off projects, just making sure that they sl slickly move from one uh, task to, to another. Um, and that spent, uh, included spent some time in uh, working in Portugal, which was, which was really nice. Um, um, uh, then for an inexplicable reason, I spent two years in HR, um, I seconded from the business into HR to to, um, to the operational type things, so sort of pay reviews, uh, um, your appraisals, first level disciplinary manager, first level um, grievance manager, um, absolutely fantastic experience with hindsight. At the time, it was absolutely horrible. HR is not for me. Uh, I can't. Um, Sort of, I never successfully, as you say in the airports, close the hangar door and leave it. Um, so when I was dealing with people who were uh, had issues, uh, I found that sort of really difficult. What um, in hindsight, what it's mean, meant is that the experience that I have with people issues, people management, and just general, you know, dealing with people, um, uh, sort of, it's a sort of uh, invaluable experience. Uh, so that was uh, that was that was that was good. Say with hindsight. Um, from from there, I moved um, back into the business, um, and I moved back towards sort of the the thread that is more uh, of where my career has got to now. So uh, I moved back into uh, I moved sorry not back into I moved to a transition management role, um, and in that transition management, this is um, from moving uh, moving uh, a project into live service. Um, or Actually, I spent more time moving um, services from one supplier to, to ourselves um, and also exiting. So moving the service from a um, live running service being supported by um, Logic, as it was at the time, um, to, to uh, other suppliers as they they want to contract. Um, and that was uh, that, that's really interesting. It's a sort of a, it's, it's akin to project management, um, but uh, very subtly, subtly different. Um, for my, my my next step was um, as a direct consequence of moving a project in, um, I was then asked to um, to be responsible for that um, for that for that service um, service delivery manager uh, central government contract. So I had a team of um, varied between twelve um, to thirty five people uh, and a number of services and suppliers about six different suppliers um, are responsible for running. Service um, for the central government contract, and that was uh, that was that was that, that was really interesting. Uh, I spent time in uh, Newcastle, as a, sort of the office manager as well, because that's where the service was run. The only service we had then, um, and then um, the sort of the. I guess a logical step from there was to sort of look at, OK, when we're looking at services or creating services, when a supply, okay, sorry, a client has asked us to um, to to take on a piece of work. Or a, a new piece, a new project, um, from from sort of grassroots all the way through, um, looking at okay, um, how do we design that so that from day one that we have an eye on it being su supportable, that the service desk, well, there's a service desk, the service desk have the right knowledge to be able to maybe if somebody phones up, they know what they're talking about, um, both the person from the phone. Um, Sorry, the, the call handler knows what the person on the phone is talking about, uh, and also they know to be able to um, to have the knowledge to try the first line fix, um, or where to um, allocate um, a ticket for it. Um, all the way through to is there enough people on the uh, service desk? Um, what happens if the service desk can't fix it? What's the organisation behind that? Um, and then are the suppliers onboarded so that we can ultimately pass tickets back to them? Uh, and that's kind of what service architecture and service design is in, is in a nutshell, uh, is to make sure that um, products, projects or services that are being created or onboarded uh, 
recorded um, have that that wrap around them. What can they do? You know, it's no good just years ago. Um, you know, a project was done, thrown over wall to live service, and live service didn't know anything about it until uh, they started getting calls about it. Um, it's to get away from that. Uh, is a very popular, very well known framework called um, ITIL. Um, which sort of tends to be tends to be my my, my life a lot of the time, uh, and looking at uh, 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 um, around those frameworks. Um, and this takes me to where I am now as a principal service architect, which just means I think I'm old, um, and, and I've done it for for for, for quite some time. Um, just dashing my conscious that uh, I could talk for hours, um, I usually do, and just thought I'd break it down into a sort of what does that actually mean as a day in the life of, of what I actually do. Um, so I've been at Atkins for four years, as you see. Most of that time I've been working with a major defence client. Um, I'm currently working on two tasks, as we call them, two projects, two service, two projects, um, with, with that uh, major defence client. I split my time completely ad hoc. It's not Monday, Tuesday, I do one, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I do another. Um, it, it's as things come across the desk, I've just got to have two, two minds on things, on things like that. Um, the 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 first um, the one that I'm in theory spend most of my time on is a um, a, a program of work where, where the client is uh, reprocuring six major services that they have. Um, they've currently got one very large supplier that does it all for them, and they need to, they've been told that they need to break this down into six smaller service providers. So um, I'm sort of in there as the lead service architect, but I'm also the the lead um, the back his engagement with that particular client uh, and the kind of things that I would be doing would be producing reviewing or approving service designs so we get service design from a managed service provider so I'd be reviewing that um, building or reviewing uh, target operating models so what is this going to look like what does the supplier think it's going to look like does that fit with my clients uh, strategy of what they want to do does it fit with everything else that they're doing um, I'm also, which is really, really interesting, part of the team that uh, evaluates bid re bid responses. So on behalf of the client, the prospective supplier uh, responds by bids, and uh, we're part in that re um, review uh, evaluation and then negotiation with the prospective um, supplier. Um, so that's that's really good. Um, I have a couple of other activities outside of the client work. Um, I lead on recruitment um, for the. Um, the Digital advantage part of uh, of Atkins where I work, um, and um, so developing a, a role as a um, as a line management champion. So we have a number of line managers. Um, we have um, between four and ten staff that we're responsible for the, for the feed of watering, um, annual appraisals, signing off, leave um, expenses, and that type of thing, and, and just sort of. And looking at sort of creating a, a role around um, championing that to, so we get better at that. And I forgot my other task um, with the with the client is I, I'm a, a title as lead solution architect. Um, so there um, there is a big more than half of the organisation is is not um, covered by any particular rigor uh, around service management. So it's looking to bring that in line. So I spend a lot of time meeting with uh, quite senior stakeholders, uh, making connections and, and selling to 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 them what the client central digital department can do to assist those three major three major business units um, that are out there and um, that have operated autonomously uh, until, until now. Um, so my, my never two days are, are never the same. Um, it, it's it's completely you know, across the three or four things that I'm doing. Um, it's it's um, it's massively interesting. Um, I did write down. Um, I'll go through it now. Um, uh, uh, conscious of time again. Um, scribbled down my biggest tips um, for a, for a lever. Um, or uh, uh, this is from my view as a as a as a recruitment manager, and also my my sort of you know, my journey over the 26 years since I left the Air Force. Um, so I see a lot of CVs. Uh, I've done 100. 50 interviews uh, thereabouts um, on behalf of Atkins in the four years um, since I've been here. Um, so my sort of top tips, which I, I've scribbled down, are please don't try and hide your forces background and the roles that you've done. Obviously, you may have need to sanitise them if they've been um, sensitive. Completely get that. Um, but I would suggest, and this is a personal view, but why would you want to work somewhere um, that wouldn't relish the experience that you've got? I'll go on to that in a minute. So. 
Um, but yeah, why why would you do that? And and, and it's fairly it, it, it's it's obvious. We see a lot of um, um, forces CVs, uh, ex forces CVs, or forces leavers CVs, um, and and the ones that just state what they do is absolutely brilliant. Um, and then you, know, and you have to try and decipher, um, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, not that we're particularly overly interested in what you've done now, but it's that experience you've got, the exposure you've got. Um, next one is. Be yourself. You know, you you there are, there's a, there's a very force you can spot forces people. I'm sure you can do it yourself. You can do it as when you, you people do X forces. Um, just be yourself. Don't try and be what you're not. Um, or I've put it here. Be yourself, but with less swearing. Certainly at the interview stage, anyway. And um, that's a sort of a, a, I'm surrounded currently by lots of X forces people. Um, I haven't been in the past. It's only in the last four years really that I've worked with a lot of veterans since I was at. Um, do research industry roles. So sessions like this, um, just find out, you know, what, what is out there, what roles can be. And I've, I've got a, another slide, but I'll save it for a question, which I've come and prompted. There's probably a question coming about the types of roles that X forces people can 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 have within the digital space. Um, but come to sessions like this um, as, as well. And and um, I've been out here. Make use of all the contacts and the freely available support available to forces leavers. So build forces is a great one. There are others, of course, um, but anybody, you know, LinkedIn is brilliant. Uh, I'm happy to sort of, you know, field any questions or support. Or what do I do? You know, how do I do? Um, there are um, job fairs uh, and all sorts of things. Really use those. They're there. There is lots of support. Um, Research the company if you're going for an interview, as we said before, but have a, you know, read up on the company that, that you're going to interview with. It doesn't have to be um, the, 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 you know, you know, absolutely everything, but at least know who they are, the markets they operate in. Um, and, and one last plea uh, or two, two things. Job adverts are quite often a wish list, so you don't have to fulfill all the criteria. Uh, and this happens sometimes with uh, um, across diversity. Um, I think you know, some people will read it. Oh, I can't do that because I can't do all the 10 of those things um, where other people will go. Do three of those really well to give it a punt. Um, I would say have a look at that and don't. It's not always the tick box. I'm close to that. I'm going to give it a go. Have that confidence because your experience is important. Um, and a plea for um, CVs. Um, in your opening paragraph of your CV, when you see me, I've received hundreds and hundreds of CVs. Your opening paragraph should state what you are or what you want to be. I see every CV is a highly motivated team player with a wealth of experience. That's good. That's given. But what do you what are you or what do you want to be? Because you might not know what you want to be. So say what you are, who you have and where your interests lie. That was a sort of a really sort of a, a plea. Um, I've massively overrun the 10 or 15 minutes that I was told I could have. Um, but um, I think hopefully that's enough. So um, back to you, Angela. Simon, that was great. Thank you. Just whilst you're taking your slide off, I'll welcome Nathan. Um, but thank you, Simon, for a brilliant opening there, a, a great sort of presentation and lots of nodding from my part there. Lots of what you said was, was coherent, I think, with with my experience as well. So, um, OK, so hi, everyone. I'm Nathan. I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Turner and Townsend. Um, I, I've got a couple of slides which I'll talk you through my journey and I hope it piques some interest um, and offers a kind of a similar but complementary view to um, uh, to Simon. So a bit about me, um, I'm the CDO of Turner & Townsend. We're a global major programs business. That just means in plain English, really big complex projects and programs across two markets, infrastructure and real estate. Within infrastructure is our defense, uh, law enforcement and national security business as well. We've got about 9,000 colleagues worldwide, about half of those are in the UK. Um, we're gusting toward 900 million of turnover and we did a good bit of growth last year, 17%. So um, lots of work to do, but a, but a good sort of uh, good trajectory for us. Alongside our core services of project management, cost management and kind of controls, big program controls, uh, and of course the QS work within that. Um, we're pushing on three imperatives globally. They're digital, net zero and advisory. And last November we partnered with CBRE they took 60% of our stock in exchange for a billion, just under a billion pounds worth of cash. Um, so that really powers up um, our ability and our global reach and frankly strengthens an already pretty, pretty good balance sheets. Um, so why, why, why digital? Um, well, I'll give you my reasons and I think some of these might have called as Simon's, but 
Um, I think uh, it's given me a compelling set of career options. I'll explain the or show the journey in a moment, uh, the scenic route most definitely. Um, I think we can capitalise on the UK and growth market opportunities. Again, in plain English, that just means there's a lot of market out there. Digital is a multifaceted sector, small, medium and large, different aspects of advisory right through to tech and development and cyber. So there's no shortage of opportunity or, or funding. It's a sustainably funded and well invested market, which is obviously quite reassuring for job seekers. Um, most businesses, if not all, but certainly most continue to need to make a step change in their capability um, and, and their kind of partnerships. Lots of companies work well together. Uh, I know Atkins, for example, and Turner and Townsend work well together. Um, so it's really interesting to see the markets come together around, around major missions and initiatives. Um, Digital is a core part of our business. It's one of our Vision 25 priorities, and many other businesses have their own version of digital at the heart of their strategy. Um, and lastly, I think really reassuringly, feedback from uh, our clients, governments, other industry players. They want and need the micro SMEs, the startups, through to the big um, global corporates to be to be digital first. Um, in terms of my own particular journey, I don't know whether to start from the start or start from where we are today. I think the more coherent view is to start from today. So uh, yeah, CEO at Turner & Townsend, been here for a year and a half and have remit across uh, predominantly the UK, but increasingly a global network of hubs. We're about 500 digital consultants in the UK, and then probably the same again, I say probably the same again, because some people have got necessarily one foot in and one foot out of digital across the globe. Um, but the UK is very much our, our hub. Um, prior to that, I was the chief digital officer at Costain and helped them acquire a company called SSL, or a pure play technology firm, and build that in to a tier one contractor. So that was a really interesting period of work um, sitting on the main board there. I then, uh, before that, had three glorious years at Atkins. Uh, I joined to set up um, something called Intelligent Mobility, um, which is a very swanky term for a brilliant business that effectively designs, tests and trials autonomous vehicles, and then looks at the data and technology platforms, not just within the vehicles, but around the kind of infrastructure and the built environment, such that connectivity and autonomy can be more pro prolifically deployed safely. Uh, I've spent and learned a lot uh, in uh, nine years at EY. Uh, I joined Ernst & Young LLP, the Chartered Accountant, where most people in there, certainly all the partners, look, looked and sounded like my dad. Um, and I left when it was EY, a very tech-enabled um, uh, global consultancy business, far more in, in, the, in the kind of skin of Accenture, really. So a really transformational nine years. Um, started off in corporate finance, looking at deal design for big technology deals uh, in financial services. But when the credit crisis happened um, and the government took over banks, banks then moved into government, which got me into infrastructure. Um, so I then spent about seven years focusing on supporting clients get major infrastructure and technology programs right, but with a real commercial imperative. Um, prior to that was three years at Aon, where I did two years in the UK and one in the US in Chicago. I was seconded into a McKinsey PMO that kind of got me into consulting. But again, um, you know, real focus on infrastructure, risk transfer. Obviously, Aon's an insurance broker, but a lot of risk strategy and risk transfer advice. Uh, and then at the start of the journey was um, seven brilliant years in the military. I was a Welsh Guards officer, a regiment I absolutely loved and still love. Went from a, a second lieutenant platoon commander, um, deployed to Ireland, a lot of ceremonial work guarding empty and full palaces, frankly, um, across London, um, and then deployed on operations. Uh, was in the US um, before and after 9-11, um, and then um, deployed into the MED for a desk job. I got injured, uh, and that prompted me to leave the military. Um, it sounds quite coherent. Uh, Lots different and distinctive between each of those brilliant businesses I've been very lucky to work in. They've all focused on infrastructure, including the military. Did a lot of work in the Balkans on um, post-conflict redevelopment. Um, they've all had a commercial return or a positive outcome imperative. I think that's really important. These are kind of five things that when I look back through the rearview mirror, they, they stand out as consistent themes. Um, they've all demanded a lot of me to try and get the best out of people. And uh, you know, that's really hard because not everyone's wanted to come on this journey of bringing technology in to try and get better outcomes. Uh, they've all had an aspect of using digital and data as an enabler. Um, it's come a long way. Some of the data and technology we work with now is a long way from my 349 as a platoon commander. 
Um, but um, but but even then, the act of connectivity, data transfer, and situational awareness was important, and it's just as important in my role at the moment. And they've all had a real imperative on running a profitable or successful business. Um, in reality, there wasn't a coherent plan, just a set of waypoints and sort of results that I selected. I kind of almost described the sort of uh, career roles, waypoints that I'd like to have. Um, and then I think I've only managed to do the journey that I've been on on the last slide because I think I've probably got three things a little bit more right than wrong. Um, I've managed to find the balance, um, which has tested me because it hasn't been easy between opportunity and longevity. So how long do you stay in a role? How long do you stay in a domain and specialism versus how opportunistic are you when something better comes along uh, and something better might be apparently better or materially better. So judgment comes with experience. I think finding the balance from one of the first things I learned. Um, the right amount of luck versus timing. Uh, I think I've been pretty lucky in my career, um, but I think I've worked really hard um, to try and make myself a little bit luckier. Um, I've also got better at judging when the right time is to uh, make a career move uh, or not make a career move um, or take some time out uh, or focus on a particular deal or back someone as well. Uh, it hasn't always landed gem side up, but these things are all about increments of, of, of sort of progression, I suppose. Um, and the last point I think I've got, again, more right than wrong, is focus versus flexibility. I have focused on the right things for what I, I think, I believe, is the right amount of time. But I've also allowed myself then to drop the focus and be flexible when there's uh, periods of confusion or massive change in the market. So if I was to sort of offer five things for, for us all to ponder on, um, from my experience alone, it's really helped me to have a destination rather than a detailed plan. Um, it's really important to, to quite prolifically network, and that doesn't mean having endless coffees with endless people, but just build your contacts across industry uh, and also build a profile. What's your personal brand? I know brand is a funny word, but you know what, what, what do people say about you when you leave the room? What are you famous for? It needs to be one thing, um, but is it you know, try and make it quite distinctive, I guess. I think Simon eloquently put it that, you know, I've lost count of how many uh, strategic leaders CVs we get. But, you know, bring yourself to life, which brings to the third point, really bring yourself to life on your CV. The ones that catch the eyes are the ones that really stand out and you say, I just want to meet this person. Um, Qualification, you know, we will assume, we'll take it as a given that you're highly capable, you've got the right qualifications, you know, you've got the right kind of uh, muscle on the CV. But what are you like to work with when the going gets tough and the going will get tough? Um, and also show us your results. Uh, commanded 6,000 soldiers. Brilliant. So what happened? What was the benefit? Greener, faster, quicker. So a real focus on results. Uh, fourthly, um, as I've done, pick a version or aspect of digital as the golden thread. I've always really focused on digital as an enabler for growth and productivity improvement and performance improvement. There are more technical uh, CDOs than you know, a greying Welsh ex Welsh Guards officer in the UK market. But I'm pretty good at spotting a deal. I'm pretty good at building a business, and I'm pretty good at applying different aspects of technology to get a commercial um, outcome or just an overall better outcome. Um, that's my thing. That might not be your thing at all. And that's perfectly perfectly good. And Simon, for example, brings a very different angle in, um, and and these things complement each other. Just just pick your pick your angle or golden thread. Um, and lastly, uh, kind of goes back to the point I made about endless coffees. It is important to meet people. Um, when I was least looking for roles, that's when they found me. Um, but do make your time count and do sort of focus your attention. So I think, Angela and Caroline, I suppose back back to you and, and back to the conversation, really. Yes, thank you, Nathan. That was incredible. I'll ask you, I'll ask you both a question. Um, how many digital managers does it take to change a light bulb? Um, so the, the answer is none. It's a hardware problem, but we're going to come back to that theme of humanisation in a sec. Just whilst um, we're blethering away here, any questions that you have, just write them in the box or raise your hand. One of the questions has come in from Daniel and is it's around the theme of can a QS sit in this space? So that would be the first part of the question. The second part would be picking up on what other roles are available available, and what titles should pe people be searching for during this recruitment process? 
Yeah, look, the, the, the answer, or my, my view is most definitely yes. We have a substantial QS business and capability globally and in the UK. Uh, we're bringing software tools in to enhance the performance of QSs or of our QS service and all its aspects. Um, and a, you know, a, a, a digital, digitally enabled QS capability is something we are working on. So it's a, it's a sort of a yes, yes, resounding yes from, from our perspective. So just on that, Nathan, what would that be? What would a, a digitally enabled QS or digitally enabled project manager look like? So for QS, some of the things we're working on at the moment is deploying a solution we have called the Hive. Um, and the Hive initially looks at um, commodity and organisational uh, benchmarking for things like costs. So how much is an organisation cost to deal with? How much are we, what, what's each component worth? How do we benchmark that so a QS can then get global data or you can filter it by segment uh, or by industry sector so you can say to a client well this is where it's what you're paying for that particular commodity or to trade with that particular organization in terms of operational costs and we think you're you know ahead of the curve because you might want to pay a bit more because there might be some you know balance sheet strength or a surety or certainty you need around and the organization not falling over or you might want to go quite cheap because it's something quite quick and you might want to get best economic value so it just basically uses data and presents it in a really smart way to help a qs make the right decisions for clients um, and as a project manager you know most organizations now have a suite of um, applications that will support things like scheduled construction change management um, pmo reporting what we are seeing is digital skills becoming a bit of a life skill um, for project management in engineering, design and um, construction and real estate programmes. OK, thank you, Nathan. Um, another question to you, Simon. You give us a snapshot of what a principal service architect does. Do you work remotely a lot? Do you office based, site based? Complete mix, absolute complete mix. So, so yesterday I was on client site. Um, today I was due to be in the Atkins office, but we don't have bunk beds in the Atkins offices. Um, no, um, but, but that meeting was cancelled. So um, it, it's very much a um, we work where um, we need to work. So um, you know we 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 employ grown ups who are um, you know build. So I build the relationship with my stakeholders, um, with be that client stakeholders, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, and I go where the where where I need to be for that day. So today I'm doing this. I've got some documents to review um, and a, a, a pretty picture to draw. Um, there's no reason for me to travel to do that. So I'm doing that here. Um, I, my day will be full of Zoom calls or well, not Zoom calls, but Teams calls. Um, so it, it's uh, when when starting a new piece of work, it's more likely to be um, in front of the client. But then I've never worked with a client who's got the space to have you there full time. And those days are long gone where they were paying for consultants and they want to be able to see them. Um, that's not the sort of the kind of relationship we have with Atkins have with our clients anyway. We've got in-depth, trusty, de and long-term um, 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 relationships. So um, it, it's one of those never two days the same, never two weeks the same. Um, I, you know, if I need to be uh, on a client site um, because I have to have meetings and those meetings might be at my behest or the client's behest, then I'll be at client site or a, a, a supplier site. Um, in in Amy Atkins, when we don't employ a lot of really, we don't really have a load of road warriors. Uh, we don't have people traveling uh, ridiculous um, uh, amounts of time. It's very much uh, sort of the, the balance. We recruit people tend to be where the work is and nowadays the work can be anywhere so um you know sometimes it needs to be face to face so we'll have people that travel in one or two days a week maybe um it's predominantly uk based because i'm in the aerospace defense security and technology business um which it tends to be because of defense and security tends to be within within um, uh, uk uh, uk space right so um, okay. and then it's all that sort of that the work life balance work life balance and, and looking after our, our our own people. A question for Nathan. So you said uh, you said that your career sounds coherent, and then you picked up on the fact that it looks incredible on paper, but perhaps it wasn't always that way. So to take you back to the start, then when you were transitioning out, did you know what you wanted to do and and where you were going to find that first role? Um, one of the things that really got me thinking about what I'd like to do next was co the coherence between. Uh, time in the military, particularly around kind of some of the overseas deployments, um, and then what organisations start to have a look at um, uh, strategic risk 
and organizations like big insurance companies will look at, you know, you can insure a car, you can insure pets, etc. When you started to insure things like satellites, um, military hardware, um, you know, commercial real estate in cities, Aon really insurance broker for the Twin Towers, for example, you start to really understand risk. And it really helps to have, I think, um, some experience in how um, military training helps you understand a potential risk landscape, how that risk landscape and situation can change. So I know insurance on the face, I remember telling a few of my friends I was getting into insurance. I think I had to shake them awake uh, after I told them that. But then if you talk about um, the sort of risk transfer you're doing, the risk anal uh, analytics, how data from different events and conflicts all feeds into a you know risk management software, but which then starts to present. So this is what we think can happen in a given scenario. Then you start to um, craft a commercial deal around, right, in order to stay safe and stay operating, we can mitigate the risks away by putting in these, these sort of countermeasures. That sounds a lot different to being you know a company commander in the military. It's not. It's not. It's a very similar way of thinking around managing risk, um, putting in place interventions, uh, and also working to a budget. Um, so that got me into Aon. Then Aon lifted my sights a little bit around working globally, and it also helped me um, find a pathway into management consultancy and business advisory, uh, which is where EY picked me up. And after that, Angela, the rest is history. The rest is history. And you said that digital uh, is an enabler for growth. I think is how you defined it. So. Your character traits you recognise as spotting a deal, spotting a business and, and being commercially aware. Where did you develop those skills from? Um, these character traits in you yeah. or do, does some of this go back to no, your military I, career? I think uh, certainly in, in the military, I was curious about everything you've mentioned, but certainly yeah. not capable. Um, Aon was really good at helping me get really economically literate um, because you have to understand uh, you know, how, the, the economic structures of some of the assets that you're trying to um, trying to assess and protect, and then also how the solutions are built up economically and commercially. Um, the real training I had was in EY. The big four, whilst they're not perfect organisations, my nine years there were completely formulative for me in terms of how I thought, the training I got, and it made me a far more commercial uh, and economically savvy technologist. So it's around, you know, so, so let's say, for example, a building or a bit of infrastructure could be worth a billion dollars. Um, if you've got that building with some form of digital representation or a lot of data around it that's managed in a really smart manner, that building's value, because it's going to be better to manage, uh, cheaper to operate, will only go up. So you're adding value to the building in this case through you know, harnessing data, governing data well, wrapping it with really smart systems and sensors. Um, and then you get that data and you can hold it on the balance sheet as an intangible asset. So you've gone from technology per se wrapping it around infrastructure or a bit of real estate. And then you've added value to the asset, added value to the company um, and had some fun in the process. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you you sound as if you thoroughly enjoy your role. Do, do you have much of a work-life balance? Are you, are you working a lot? Yeah, I do work a lot. Yeah, I mean, the the the, the, the big four role was, was pretty full on because that was, a, you know, all across Europe and then to Simon's point, you know, you, you do tend to travel in, in other companies, actually in Atkins, I was the MD for the tech business in, in Europe. Um, so that was a bit of travel. Um, but to be honest, you know, if you again, if you look back, you go where the work is, you travel as needed. None of it was none of it was sort of punitive. It wasn't um certainly wasn't six months deployed with two weeks break in the middle. Um so no, it was all right. And a range of accommodations from you know, a hotel inside a service station on a motorway truck stop that will stay with me forever, right <laughs> through to you know, swanky hotels if big American corporates are paying for it and everything in between. Yeah, no, of course. And your um, your day to day, it sounds quite eclectic and quite different. Are you online quite a lot? Or are you still face to face? Um, we were online, obviously, during the lockdown and yeah. restrictions. But I was chatting to our chief exec yesterday. You know, our view is very much people are people are best performing and, and I think best best sort of product, most productive together. Um, so I think we're probably we've, we've kind of crossed the Rubicon where we're encouraging people to be in the office as much as you can in order to facilitate the great, you know, ideas, creation, that kind of personal contact. That said, I certainly do one or two days a week from home. And that's partly just because it's an ease on the travel, but also I'll design the days or design the week such that there's time to, you know, review reports. 
focus on telephone calls, that sort of thing. So, um, but I have to say, for you know, we've had a lot of our teams together recently on big strategy days as we reset for the new financial year. Those are most definitely best done in person. Yes, yeah, and of course, and they're thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable as well. So, we've been speaking to a few colonels and lieutenant colonels. So, this question is more for them. In terms of being at a board position now, what advice would you give somebody that's at a very senior rank that's coming to the end of a 22 to 36 year service? How do they achieve that board level role? Um, so I think it's about uh, understanding that there is a difference um, and that, you know, in some instances, stepping from one to the other, I think can happen. Um, don't underestimate the difference. And the similarities are compelling around strategic vision, um, a sort of a, a, a grand scale leadership, really thinking through problems, um, complex problems on a macro level. That's all very viable stuff that people want to buy as is. Um, rightly or wrongly, and I still can't work out if it's rightly or wrongly, there's a big primacy on, um, you know, that advice can have immediate applicability in defence, for example. But if it's around wider business, I, I learned the hard way that having some time to knuckle down and learn and sort of effectively rapidly, I hope, but work your way up the career path a little bit back to an equivalent position is time well taken because then you you really understand the market you're working in, the businesses you're working in. Um, I certainly didn't leave, you know, seven years in the Welsh Guards who not trained me to work in a listed American global insurance business. Um, so I went in on higher pay. Um, but as a, as I was a trainee insurance broker, um, sitting on an upside down bin in the corner of the office, learning about the business and about markets, um, but it did me good. Right. Okay. And a question to you, Simon, you said that you're involved a lot with, um, in the recruitment space. So in terms of salary bans and entry qualifications, what advice would you give the year? organization now and previous organizations they, they they where we are now we have broad salary bands depending on um, experience i think if you find a a a, a good recruiting company um or something or i i say to all candidates we don't look at somebody uh, and who may come in um appear to be cheap because you know forces pay maybe lower than uh, we, you get in in, in industry, um, it, it's uh, it's an it, it's an impossible thing to say. Find a company that will will, will review you against your peers rather than review you against your current salary. So who we got somebody you know if we were a role and our roles can vary from thirty thousand to way more than that so um you know if you've got a role somewhere and i'm sitting thinking oh this role i'm looking for i don't know pays uh, mid 60s i'm using it as an example uh, and the cv comes in the current salary is is 45 i'm not going to sit there and say brilliant bargain and get this person in for low price uh, low price uh, and, and and that's great um it, it's it's about I think it, the, the only way as a candidate is to sort of get the feeling for the organization um, and you can do this in an interview it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing but um so and i will say you know as a candidate when we talk about the salary um, point um and we say you know the, the salary range kind of thing or what is your current expectation and and it's more and more and we're getting pushed rightly getting pushed around um diversity inclusion uh, uh, etc uh, around not really looking at what the salary is coming in because it doesn't it doesn't matter um because it may be more than we can can pay or maybe less than we're currently paying um, and it's around getting that um the the skills and the experience and the person so i know i will look for the person is this the type of person that fits in with atkins the consultancy you know um and then they look at the sort of the, the their their consultancy experience you know, we, we can we can you can train some soft skills but you can't train um people with, with in, in in the rounded and, and as they are as a person but we can train people in consultancy skills and we can train people in technical skills so it, it's about and, and i'm not really answering your question i feel it, just to make it a bit more pointed then yeah. so do you feel that the service lever should expect pay parity or just be really open-minded i i i think that it completely it, 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 it does depend on the role i suspect okay. um i i would um I would not necessarily encourage uh, anyone to take a pay cut unless it was for the particular reason that they are maybe changing roles. And there are 
there are things out there and you know, Glassdoor and other things where you get some expectation but don't be afraid to have that conversation Haven't okay yes no answer sorry no 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 that's perfect thank you a question to you both as you as you transition it's taking you way back but as you transitioned what did you both learn about yourself so I'll ask you first Nathan um, the uh, industry would value my uh, experience and capabilities and training far more than I thought. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to demilitarise my CV. That was right and wrong. It was right in terms of terminology because not everyone knew what SA3, G3 ops meant um, and indeed so what. Um, but actually bringing out the really compelling parts of, of, of military experience and training. So I put those front and centre. That goes back to the point I made about you know, try and let yourself come out of the CV. Um, and, and, and yeah, so, so, so I think it's it's something to be absolutely proud of. But as a bit of a top tip, I think don't don't militarize, don't, don't let CVs be too militarized. Um, there are recruiters and people like myself in most most big organizations, particularly those that sign up for the military covenant, that understand military CVs. So let us do that decoding for you. And you can always you know explain in the, in the conversation, um, but really focus on the attributes and the skills and the positives that, that you can bring so on the last point about salary i'll be honest yep. um i think i think you should be definitely depending on the sector and the type of role and if you need a big learning curve as simon has mentioned you should definitely be looking for a pay uplift i think um i know the military salary grades pretty well uh, if we're talking about digital the digital um uh, sector in all its different types there is a premium uh, in digital at the moment so if you're looking for a pay rise um, it would be wise to consider using resettlement and then targeting your search around digital roles in companies that will give you a pay uplift if that's what you're after. OK, and the question to you as well, Simon, what did you learn about yourself when you transitioned? I think it was don't underestimate the ingrained work ethic you get in the in the military. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a two edged sword. Um, I found I, I found it um, initially really easy. Um, to be in the situation where someone goes, that's absolutely brilliant. You know what you're doing there is fantastic. You know you're putting the, you know you're really sh sort of shifting some stuff, some work here, um, and thinking, well, actually, I'm just doing what I was sort of, you know, not putting any more effort than, than I'm used to putting in, uh, and that's that was a sort of, you know, put really bluntly, dumbing it right down. Um, but then the two-edged sword is, don't necessarily, oops, can't speak, don't necessarily assume that um, others are going to share the same work ethic. And I find um, I, I have somebody who's, who's working for me at the moment who's a couple of years out of leaving um, the forces. He finds it a real struggle that not everybody has the same motivation as him. Now, maybe he's too much. Maybe he's not. Doesn't matter. It's the everybody is different. Yeah, it is one of the big things because in the forces you're all certainly I was I, I left with almost no rank um, uh, at all. Um, and I, I was I was I did what I was told. And I worked hard um, and, and, and not everybody's used to that. So you just have to. It's a balance. Everybody is different. You're 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 trained to do the same things mostly, certainly when I was, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a junior rank, just trained to do like everybody else does. OK. So it's that difference. Thank you, Simon. And a question has come in from Tim Glover. I think you're busy typing away there, Nathan, but I will read it out just for those watching back. Um, he's asked, so I expect he's applying for a non-exec director role, and I think what he wants to major on is should he push his leadership skills from his armed forces career, or should it be more around being a, a team player, having a, a, a followership so he's able to, to lead um, and guide others? What's the most important quality? Uh, for a non-exec director, it's the non-bit, um, so you've got to resist the, the temptation to manage the business yourself. You are there advising, guiding, counselling, steering, providing options, uh, but you shouldn't, and in some cases are mandated against providing the answer. The management team has got to do that. Having sat on a management board with NEDS, uh, I learned pretty quickly that they 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 offer you pro probably six or seven options, the answer's in there, but you're paid a lot of money to make the decision. So resist the temptation to get too close, um, provide the answer, you don't run the business, you advise and steer it. Um, and then things like leadership and followership, of course, they're perennial skills and qualities, but taking a, a mindset of I'm here to advise, guide, optioneer, you know, a bit of a guide, philosopher, friend rather than a doer, uh, I think is the secret source for a NED. OK, perfect. Sorry, I just, Simon. I was just going to say, I'm just wondering if I read the question um, differently. 
um, it is that it is a non-executive role, as in um, not not on the board, uh, not as a senior role, but more of a sort of you know in amongst the business. Um, then um, leadership is vital in all roles because you know you got and in all positions. So I, I would um, don't downplay the leadership experience you've got because even if you're not managing, you have to manage your client. You have to manage the people that work for you. You have to manage your managers. Um, and, and so, and that's, you know, managers is, is I'm using that word consciously rather than leadership, um, but it means the same thing. So yeah, you, you don't underestimate it. Don't downplay it. Um, it's more of a, um, it, it's having the, the sort of the rounded thing, um, but leaders will rise to the top wherever you are. So okay. if I read the question differently, uh, or incorrect. That's great. Thank you, Simon. Well, listen, thank you to both Simon and Nathan for their contribution today and incredible answers to the Q&A and for their presentations. And to our military community who are watching, you've heard from two great veterans and digitalization is about doing it smarter and more effectively. It's pulling in your skill set. This is a fantastic second career. Um, and there are many rewards and challenges and thrills. Um, you will not be replaced by a robot in 10 years time, I think is what we've been assured by today. So you are not alone through this transition. Billforce are here to support and guide you as you transition. So please get in touch if you have any questions and we will help you take it further. And I will pass back to Caroline to share some final insights. Thanks, Angela. Um, yeah, so just, just to follow up on that, thanks, guys. That was great. It was really nice to see two very, very different angles and levels of the digital space. So I'm sure a great help to uh, those listening today and, and beyond. So as Angela said, please do get in touch. We are here to support you through mentoring, work placements, connections such as Nathan and Simon. Um, and next up, we have next week, we have Costain. And um, that will be on Wednesday because I'm at CTP on the Thursday. Um, so they will have different areas of expertise from their company um, explaining uh, what the organisation does and what they're looking for. And then following that is our very fantastic face to face Armed Forces Insight Day in Manchester on the 13th of October. It's going to be a fantastic event with some live site visits to some of the um, home building um, properties uh local sorry i'm babbling now but all i'm trying to say is book in if you are transitioning or just thinking of your next chapter it's a fantastic event to talk to employers most of them are veterans so they understand where you're at they understand your transferable skills and they'll understand where the, where you'll fit in their organization so that's the 13th of October. Let me know if you wanted a place. So enjoy the day. I'm hoping the sun's going to come out because I've got a long run to do later and um, speak to you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Bye.